All right, so what I want to talk to you about next is the pieces, parts of the chainsaw chain. So we've got a simulated chain here. Um, so this piece is a drive link, and the drive link is connected to the cutter, which would be this piece, by a rivet via a tie strap. So those pieces, parts all together combined to make a continuous loop known as a chain. There are some unique features about the drive links that they're actually grooved and ported so that as it rotates through the bar, it picks up a drop of oil and forces it up into that rivet to keep it lubricated as, as the chain is turning around your, your bar and sprockets. A couple different types for simplicity here. We'll talk about two different ones today. Um, one basically is a, is a chisel style chain, meaning it has a flat top and side with a square corner um, that works much like a flat chisel for woodworking. And then we have a semi-chisel chain that has a rounded corner um, that doesn't have such a defined point. And it's a little more forgiving working in uh, dirty conditions or uh, in the hands of an occasional user. Whereas this one is um, designed for professional use, it cuts faster, but it also dulls easier, and it's a little harder to keep sharpened. So, in order to sharpen the chain, um, we've got to maintain a correct height with our file as we are pushing the file at the correct direction. So, there's an angle here on this this front edge and it's anywhere from 30 to you know, from 20 25 30 35 degrees depending on what kind of chain you're running so that's that angle here and as you are sharpening you are creating this chisel angle from underneath of the cutter so if you're holding the file at the correct height as you push it through it creates the correct angle here so if you're too far down in the cutter when you're filing, you could be filing underneath of this edge, which isn't sharpening it, or you could be too high as you're filing and it's not creating that correct angle and it's more straight up and down, creating more of a hammer type effect as opposed to a chisel. So it's important to be able to hold that at the correct depth. And if you were to look at the end of your file, you wanna keep about one third of, of the diameter of the file above that flat of the cutter as it's filing through there. So you're pushing it across. So there are all kinds of mouse traps in the world in order to help you sharpen. Um, this is a very basic file guide. It allows you to never get too deep or too high as long as the flat of both sides are riding on the top of the cutter. So that creates the perfect depth, but what it doesn't do is it'll keep you from filing in a half moon shape or at a different angle than, uh, than it's required to be. So because we have right-hand cutters and left-hand cutters, the angle of this top plate angle needs to be the same. Because if it's not, the chain is going to want to pull to one side or the other um, and not cut straight and cut crooked or get so far down into the cut and get bound up and not go any further. So when we pick our angle that we're filing at, if we're filing at 30 degrees, it's very important that all the cutters on both sides are sharpened at that 30 degree angle. And here is another device that works with that. This tool allows me to set the correct depth for my file. It also has a flat file in place that allows me to file the depth gauge. So there's, there's a relationship here. 
that as I sharpen the cutter, it gets shorter in length. And it also gets shorter in height because it's actually ramped. It's higher here at the point than it is at the back. So as this cutter gets shorter, this depth gauge has to be lowered in order to achieve a correct ratio. So this tool allows that to happen in one pass. You push, you're actually sharpening the cutter and lowering the depth gauge at the same time. However, it still doesn't allow you to maintain a precise or exact angle as you file. So probably what helped me the most to be able to maintain that is that I set myself up in a position to where as I am pushing the file, once I get set up at that 30 degree angle, and that's where I sharpen my chains at, is that I set myself up so that my filing arm works in a straight line. and I'm not bound up in myself or in, in the tooling that's around me. And sharpening every cutter until it's until it's has a clean, crisp edge all the way across and has a very defined point. Um, with this tool, it does the depth gauge at the same time, so um, it's not as important uh, as it was in the old days. They used to say you had to sharpen every cutter with the same amount of strokes on both sides. Um, if you're using a depth gauge tool that works independently of each cutter or does it in one motion, then it's not so important. But if you're using a depth gauge tool that takes an average of the cutter that you are working with and successful cutters front and back from it, then it's much more important to sharpen that chain evenly on both sides, left and right, in order to maintain. So this depth gauge tool, if you look really close, it's sitting on this cutter that I wanna, I wanna work, sitting on one, two, three cutters in front and one behind. So it's taking the average of five cutters in order to do the depth gauge of one cutter. Whereas, this tool allows us to work independently with a single cutter all the way around the chain, having two settings, one for hardwood and one for softwood. Um, we're in the Eastern hardwood belt and we cut predominantly hardwood trees. So we use the hard setting and it's as simple as anything that sticks up through that hole we file off. This would have done it for us already. It takes an average of the cutter you're working on and one cutter in front of you. So it's riding on, on two cutters with the front rail and the back rail. It gets a little confusing when you switch to the other side. You have to uh, pop this apart, change the direction of your flat file, and then you have to change your direction of your round file in order to sharpen the cutter on the other side.